We arrive today at the busiest day of Jesus's ministry as recorded in the Gospels. And this this particular day, busy as it is, is going to mark a turning point in the offer of Jesus to the nation of Israel. The religious leaders have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They've attributed the power of Christ over demons to Satan working through Christ, if you can imagine that. And with that, there's this point of no return that has occurred as Israel's religious leaders reject Jesus, King Jesus, and eventually lead the nation to reject him as well. Now, from this point forward, Jesus is no longer going to declare that the kingdom of God is at hand, and that's because the literal kingdom, that offer, is now postponed. Now, uh, keep this in mind, beloved, none of this is surprising the Lord. This isn't plan B now. This is part of his plan. In fact, just as Adam's rebellion against God didn't throw God's plans out the window, well, Israel's rejection of King Jesus is part of God's plan for the ages. Now, there are two terms that need defining before we, we move forward, and one of those terms is dispensation or dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a system that's derived basically from consistently interpreting the entire Bible literally as I'm doing today. This literal approach to Scripture leads to an understanding that there are various periods of time or dispensations when God and his people uniquely relate to one another. Think about it this way. Adam and Eve lived in what we call the dispensation of innocence. Uh, That was a period of time when Adam and Eve were sinless. God took some form and and walked with them physically in the evening. There's no death during this period. And there's no clothing either, by the way. Well, later came what we call the dispensation of the law with its sacrificial system, the Mosaic laws of diet, Sabbath worship. Now, today, we're living in the New Testament dispensation. That is, this is a a period of time we would call the dispensation of the church. What a wonderful dispensation this is. Uh, The Holy Spirit now uh, indwells each of us. Unlike the the Old Testament dispensations, we we can now worship the Lord directly. We can can talk with him personally. We don't need a priesthood. We don't need animal sacrifices. And one day, we're going to move into the dispensation of the kingdom. That's when Jesus returns with us to earth following the tribulation. And, And again, a lot of things are going to change in that dispensation. Right now, you happen to be a future king or queen who's going to uh, co-reign with Jesus Christ in his future kingdom, Revelation 19 and 20. Give us the details. Now, follow me here. Even though Israel has rejected the kingdom offer of Christ, God still has a kingdom program going on. So what does the Bible mean now when it talks about the kingdom of God, now that we're in this dispensation of the church or the church age. Well, today Jesus reigns internally, spiritually, in the lives of his followers. One day he's going to reign physically and literally over all the earth in that future dispensation of the millennial kingdom. Now, the second term I want to define is the word parable. Parable literally means that which is cast alongside. In other words, it's, a, it's an earthly story delivering a heavenly truth that's brought alongside. It's a story about something, you know, very natural, birds, trees, grass, whatever, and it teaches, though, something spiritual. Now, because the Jewish leaders have rejected the kingdom offer of Christ, the truths of the kingdom that are contained in Jesus' parables here are going to be a mystery to them. Only people who follow Jesus are going to be given understanding of the eternal truths alongside these earthly stories. So, what does God's kingdom program look like today? Well, 
The Lord's going to answer that in parables. He's going to be sitting now here in a boat. He's going to be speaking to a crowd there along the shore. And Jesus delivers his first parable. We find it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 3. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. The farmer's field in these days would be divided into plots with pathways running in between. And over time, all the foot traffic on those paths would harden the soil like cement. Now verse 5. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Now verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Now verse 8, and other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. When I hear in verse 14, Jesus begins to explain this parable to his disciples. And first he explains that the sower sows the word. So the seed is the word of God. And Jesus explains that as we we sow the seed, we can expect four different responses. I want to call the first response an unreceptive heart. This is the seed that falls on the hardened footpaths described Uh, here as Jesus talks about people who hear the word. Verse 15 says, but then Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown. So Satan's, he's kind of like a bird who flies in and sweeps away the word. Frankly, this this is relatively easy work for the devil because this is a hardened heart. It's unreceptive to begin with to the word of God. Well, the second response we could call an impulsive Heart. This is the rocky soil, and Jesus explains over here in verse 16, they hear the word and immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Their response is enthusiastic, but it's, it's shallow. It's short-lived. They expect a Christianity to be, well, comfortable. You know, somebody might have told them that Jesus would fix all their problems, their medical problems, their, you know, their, uh, their bank account's a little low, he'd fill it up. Well, Jesus says here, persecution arrives, Christianity effectively, you know, doesn't solve their problems, it creates problems, and they eventually realize, well, <laughs> Jesus, I guess he isn't the tooth fairy after all. So, they walk away. They had never believed to begin with. Well, now you have the third potential response to the sowing of the word. This is what I'd like to call a preoccupied heart. Over here in Luke's gospel in chapter 8, Jesus describes them here in verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. With them then, the worries of the world, the magnetism of materialism, well, that becomes their priorities in life, and and it chokes off spiritual fruit. The first two responses, by the way, are clearly from unbelievers. They do not believe to be saved, verse 12 says. Others believe for a while, according to verse 13. The soil here in verse 14 actually has fruit. I want you to notice, they have fruit, but it doesn't mature. You see, somewhere along the line, they became preoccupied with the world around them. I believe they're saved. But because of poor decisions, wrong priorities, they are fruitless. They have grown old in their faith, but they aren't growing up in their faith. You know, I know a lot of baby Christians who aren't growing up, and they've been saved for years. They're not reproducing spiritual fruit like they should. Now, here in Mark's Gospel, again, chapter 4, Jesus describes the fourth response here in verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Well, now this is the responsive 
heart. In these last two soils, the same word for fruit is used in the original text. But here, the fruit is multiplying. Why? These believers are maturing. They're faithfully bearing fruit by their obedient lives for the glory of God. These are people who are not only growing older in the faith, but they're growing up in the faith. And here's an encouragement for you today, beloved. Regardless of how people respond out there, well, just keep sowing the word. Their response is not your responsibility. A farmer doesn't create the seed. He doesn't make it grow. God does that. A farmer can't make those seeds come to life. Only God can. So all you and I can do is what? Well, we we sow the seed. So let's be faithful in sowing the seed of God's Word today. Until next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.